Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church, Friday Night Live message. And today's topic, No Animal is Forgotten by God. And this is based on Luke chapter 12, verse 6. So a few announcements before we start. One is that we're having Facebook Fellowship after the live talk today. So we'd love to have you join us for that. And also, uh, we sent... Uh, we have a, a new volunteer. We have a treasurer now, so thank you uh, to our, our new treasurer. And we also sent out our, our thank yous to all of the uh, people who made donations throughout the year. So just wanted to thank you again for everyone who's made donations to us this year uh, and helped purchase all this equipment and uh, the services for our website and all that kind of stuff. So we appreciate that. And for all the people who are volunteering, uh, we appreciate you volunteering your time as well. Uh, just as we're all the body of Christ and Creation Care Church is just, you know, one of those, uh, whatever you would want to call it, within the body, like uh, an organ or something, I don't know. Uh, and so uh, everyone is working for God's glory and it's all volunteer based. So thank you to everyone who's been a part of that. And I think that's all for announcements. So let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for everything that you do for us, and thank you for this group that's joined here today. And we just ask that you give us insight into this topic and uh, really show us what it is that we can learn from uh, no animal being forgotten, and just give us insight into this topic. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with... Luke chapter 12, verse 6. That is Luke chapter 12, verse 6. So there it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? So this passage is interesting because there's two things going on in it. One is that people are selling animals for profit or it's trading them for money. And the other part of it is none of these animals that are being sold and exchanged for money are forgotten by God. So God remembers all these animals, even though we're treating them as commodities to be bought and sold. And so there's a lot that really can be gained from this. And uh, we want to kind of look at those two components. So animals being sold as commodities and then animals not being forgotten by God. And then we're going to talk a little bit at the end about uh, what this should mean for us. Uh, and should we be participating in this buying and selling of animals? Uh, and what would it mean to remember the animals the way God does? So let's look at the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 16. So John... Chapter 2, verse 16. And just to live, give you a little bit of context, this is the, uh, there's the temple, which is the place where all the animal sacrifices are made, and Jesus is going into that temple, and he's basically disrupting this business, where the Sadducees, who are the ones who are in control of the temple, and they're just in it for the profit, and they're just buying and selling these animals to be sacrificed because it's just their business enterprise, basically. And so this is what he does. It says that he makes a, a cord of whips uh, or a whip of cords and he drives out the animals. And then it says here in 16, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise or other translations say a marketplace. And so Jesus is saying, don't be buying and selling animals uh, as a business. And some people, they, they like to say, uh, well, it's, it's really, it's about the, the money changers. They're just ripping people off. But this is mentioned in all four gospel accounts. And the money changers are only mentioned in three of the four accounts. So if the money changers are the main people that Jesus has a problem with, uh, he, they, they wouldn't be like omitted from one of the four accounts. And so that's how we know that that's not the main focus of what he's doing. And also the verses that he quotes 
Uh, in this one, it's uh, merchandise, and in the other one in Matthew, it's a den of robbers. And both those passages have to do with uh, animal sacrifice, not about ripping people off. And so if it were really just about ripping people off, then he would have cited one of the scripture verses about not having weighted scales and being honest in business, but he doesn't do that. So it's clearly not about ripping people off, and uh, as a lot of people try to style it, uh, he's doing it because he, he's ending animal sacrifice, and he's saying this is not what God wants, just like all the prophets before him uh, were saying. So let's look at one of those other accounts. Let's look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So this den of thieves or den of robbers is probably a, a more accurate translation where it's not just like stealing something. It's where you basically uh, beat someone up and take everything they have and leave them in this bloody mess. That's like you robbed someone. And so that, that's basically what he's, what he's saying here is that's the term he's using, not someone who like stealthily, you know, pickpockets you or something like that. So he calls them a den of robbers, and he's saying he's making God's house a house of merchandise, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. So now let's look at another verse. Let's look at Zechariah 11, verse 5. So going into the... Minor Prophets, the Old Testament, the Tanakh. There's Zechariah chapter 11, verse 5. There it says, uh, starting with verse 4, Thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock, uh, whose owner slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell, sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich and their shepherds do not pity them. So this, this idea that these shepherds aren't pitying the animals that they're raising and just selling to be slaughtered, and uh, they're just saying, well, I'm rich. I, I raised these animals to make money, and I made my money. So I got what I wanted. And he's saying he's not, they're not having pity for the animals. And this, this idea of pity is like sympathy or compassion and so when we're not thinking about the animals and it's just about making profit, then we're not really doing what God wants. We're just making his house a house of merchandise. And now the temple that he was referring to that Jesus was disrupting, that was representing God's house. It's God, God's dwelling place. He's dwelling among us. And he's tabernacling among us. And, uh, but the whole house, the whole earth is uh, supposed to be God's dwelling place where he's supposed to dwell among us everywhere. And so when we're making his, his temple into this den of thieves and this house of merchandise, well, that's what we're doing with the whole world uh, as his house. So we wanna stop making his house a house of merchandise where we're selling animals to be slaughtered, uh, but rather we should be showing them this pity. And so now let's look at Matthew chapter six, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, or another translation, both God and money, or God and riches. So those two things are antithetical to each other. You cannot be worshiping money and living to serve money and also living to serve God. Those two things are not going to be compatible with each other. And so when it comes to uh, buying and selling animals for profit, uh, I, I think that as it pertains to this particular issue, it's like, are you those shepherds who are like, well, whatever, I'm rich, I don't care, I don't have any pity for these animals, I'm just in it for the money. Or are you someone who cares for the animals like Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my flock. Uh, I don't sell them, betray them to be uh, be slaughtered. That's what Judas Iscariot did. He he betrayed Jesus and the flock so that Jesus would, would be uh, slaughtered. And so we don't want to be like that. We want to be like Jesus, who's the good shepherd. And so we, we can't be worshiping money 
uh, and thinking of it all as just, oh, well, animals are just here to profit off of. It's like, no, that's not what it's about. And of course, when it comes to participating in those things, even if you're not the one selling the animals or even buying the animal while the animal's still alive, if you're buying their slaughtered bodies, uh, then you're participating in that as well. So let's look at a couple of verses. Let's look at Psalm chapter 50. So Psalm 50 verses 10 and 11. So Psalm 50 verses 10 and 11. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. So this is God speaking and he's saying every animal belongs to me. So if we're buying and selling animals for profit, well, we're, we're selling animals that belong to God and we're buying animals or their chopped up bodies that belong to God. And so are we buying and selling things that belong to God? Well, if everything belongs to God, then we shouldn't be thinking, well, this is mine. I'm, you know, I can buy and sell it for profit. It's my commodity. Well, animals aren't your commodity. Animals are beings that belong to God. And so we want to treat them the way that God tells us how to treat them. And so if we look at uh, Proverbs 12.10, so that's Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. It says, a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Or another translation, the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. So if every animal belongs to God, then we're supposed to be doing what God says, how to treat them. So he says here, he wants us to regard their life, not to be cruel to them. And so uh, when it comes to buying and selling animals, like these people in the temple that Jesus disrupted their business practice, are they being cruel to the animals? Or are they caring for the needs of the animals? And the one who's disrupting and saying, I do away with this, don't be buying and selling animals. Is he the one who's caring for their needs as a good shepherd? Or is he the one being wicked and cruel? I think we can, we can all connect the dots there. And so one last verse pertaining to animals being sold and bought as commodities. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. And this is the, the final of the Ten Commandments. I guess unless you're in the, using the Samaritan Pentateuch, then it would be number 10 of 11. But regardless, it's number 10. It says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So this, this idea of coveting, we don't really use that word covet very often in, in common parlance today, at least not in English. Uh, so some, some words that are very similar to covetousness that portray this meaning would be greed or avarice. And avarice is this idea that you excessively desire something and it's uh, often pertaining to wealth or just really this covetousness is anything that doesn't belong to you and you're, you're desiring it. It's this evil desire to possess something that's not meant for you. So these examples that are given, it's like, it's your neighbor's house. And you're like, well, I want that. It's like, well, it's not yours. It's your neighbor's. And it's like, well, I want my neighbor's wife. I want, you know, it's like, well, that's adultery. And so that you're, that's not yours. That's your neighbor's wife. Um, same with would be for husband. And it's like they're, they're animals, uh, anything that belongs to your neighbor. So when it comes to animals, uh, when, when let's say a mother cow gives birth to a baby and she produces milk, well, who is that milk for? Well, it's for her baby, her calf. And so if we're, if we're desiring that and we say, no, I want that instead of the baby calf, well, that's covetousness. We're desiring something that's not intended for us. Uh, similar to, let's say, uh, honey that comes from bees. Well, that's for bees. They need that. That's how they survive through the winter. That's their sustenance. And so if we're like, well, I want that instead. 
It's like, well, that's covetousness. It, it's not for you. It's for them. Uh, God gave us the fruit of the tree and the, uh, and the herbs of the ground. That's our food. So uh, we, shouldn't be ex- we shouldn't be desiring these things that were not intended for us. And when it comes to the bodies of animals, those are for the animals. And so if we kill the animal in order to, to eat their body, we're, that's covetousness. We're desiring something that's not intended for us. Uh, that's intended for the animal who God breathed life into that animal's body so that uh, that animal can live. And if we take that from the animal, we're taking something that belongs to our neighbor, not to us. And that's intended for our neighbor, not for us. So we don't want to be uh, buying and selling animals or their, their milk or their bodies or their honey or, or their eggs or any of those kinds of things or the leather, their skin. We want to allow those to continue to be owned by the animals and everything belongs to God and so if God chooses to give those things to an animal uh, we should allow that to uh, take place we should love our animal neighbor as ourself just like we love our human neighbor as ourself and we should not have that covetousness where we desire those things that don't belong to us we should be content with the very good things that God gives us So now let's talk about the the animals not being forgotten by God. So let's look at Luke chapter 12 and start with verse 24. So Luke chapter 12 and let's look at verse 24. It says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? So there's two things going on in this passage. One is that the the animals are being taken care of by God. So the animals don't have to store up a bunch of you know food in a barn. And the idea would be if we're if we're trying to store up money so you can like I don't know. Uh, live luxuriously or whatever. Uh, there's other passages that talk about this, how a man tries to, to store up a bunch of whatever wealth so that he can live comfortably and then his life is demanded of him the very next day. And so we want to trust in God. We don't want to take from others to store up for ourselves uh, way more than we need. Uh, but the idea here is that God takes care of the animals because he cares about them, right? He doesn't. He wouldn't take care of them if he doesn't care about them. And so, if it says we are of more value than the animals, well, that suggests that the animals have value to God. And so, we should likewise treat them as if they have value to God, because God says they have value to Him. And so, the the reason we have more value is because we're the animal or the creature that's uh, that's being put over all the other creatures to take care of them. It says that we have dominion. That's Genesis chapter one verse twenty eight. Uh, and 26. So if we're having dominion, we're the creature that's designed and given this responsibility to take care of the other creatures. We want to do that. We want to fulfill that that calling that God has in our lives. And so uh, the animals are valuable to God, just like we are valuable to God. And just like he takes care of them, he takes care of us. So now let's look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. It's the very last verse in Jonah. So Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. I always want to call Jonah, Jonah, because I have a a friend in ministry. Her name is Jonah, and so uh, people often call her Jonah because uh, they they just think, oh, but she has two N's. So anyway... Uh, so now whenever I look at Jonah, I, I think, oh, well, let's pronounce this Jonah. But it's like, no, 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 that's, that's Jonah. And anyway, so let's look at the, the final verse of the book of Jonah. This is chapter 4, verse 11. It says, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also many animals? So God here is showing pity on the city, Nineveh, who's steeped in sin and doesn't know their left hand from their right, which the, the left hand represents like harm and the right hand represents the, the mercy. And so the, they aren't able to distinguish between the two. 
And so he's having pity on them. And it says he's not just having pity on the people, but also on the animals. And so this is one of the one of the most wonderful stories in the Bible, in that at the preaching of Jonah, all the people and even the animals, they repent. And God sees that they repent. They turn away from their wicked ways. And God sees that, and he relents of the disaster, and he protects them from it. And so this, this is a, a great illustration of what it means for all of us, uh, anyone who turns away from their wicked ways, turns away from following the, the enemy and the way of sin and death and evil desires, and instead turns to God. And uh, it, when, we, when we turn to him, he forgives us and he heals us and he protects us from those disastrous consequences uh, that, that are at the end of the road of that, that path of evil desire leading to sin, leading to death. So he saves us from that, that destruction. And he saves us from that eternal destruction that comes at, on the day of judgment at the last day. And so uh, that's the one that we, we really want to be saved from. So we want to turn away from serving the enemy and the lies and the deception and the violence. We want to instead turn to the love of God, put our faith in him. So now let's look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Genesis chapter 8. Verse 1, and this is the flood comes and destroys everything, and then Noah and all the animals are in the boat, the ark, and there's all this water covering the earth. And so then it says in Genesis 8, verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living creature, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. So here, God's not just remembering Noah and his family that are in the ark, but he's also remembering the animals. This is important because a lot of people skip over this idea of uh, animals playing a prominent role and God caring about the animals. It doesn't say, and God remembered the rocks, or God remembered the, you know, the salt, or you know, whatever other things. Uh, it says that God remembered the, the humans and the animals. And then when we look a little bit further, and it says this multiple times throughout the chapter, but if we look at chapter 9, verse 9, it says, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and then 10, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And so, again, here, God's remembering the animals by including them in his covenant promise. So this is this everlasting covenant that God's establishing. He's establishing not, not just with the people, but also with the animals. So he remembers the animals, and he establishes his covenant with them. That's how much he remembers them. They're not forgotten by God. And so now let's look at another story in Numbers chapter 20. So Numbers chapter 20, it's the, the fourth book in the, the Old Testament or the, in the Torah. So it's number four book, but it's Numbers chapter 20. And so just to kind of give you a, a backstory about what's going on, there's the, the people who are in this exodus and they have their, their animals with them and they're going through the desert and there's no water. So they're all dying of thirst. And they're, they start grumbling and they're like, Moses, have you led us out here just to die of thirst, us and all the animals? And so then it says in verses four and five, why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Uh, it is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So they don't have food, they don't have water, they're dying. And so this idea here, this is the second time this happens, is also happens in Exodus 17. And what God does is he says, okay, Moses, I want you to go to this rock and hit it with your staff and water is going to come out of it. And all the people and all the animals are going to be able to drink from this water. And now this time, God says, speak to the rock. 
and uh, Moses does not follow that instruction. Instead, he strikes the rock twice, and he takes the glory for himself, and this ends up being the thing that keeps him out of the promised land. But it says here in verse 11, so Numbers 20, verse 11, Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. So this is a, a story where the, the people and the animals are dying of thirst, and God supplies them with this water uh, to take care of them. And how do we know that it was God? How do we know that it wasn't Moses, even though Moses was the one who was striking this rock to make the water come out? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And so this is speaking of that, uh, that time where he's uh, going to the rock to get water out, both times really, the one in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, it says, And all drank the same spiritual drink. That's the water that came out of the rock. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So this is Christ who was giving them that water. It was these living waters that they were drinking. And so uh, Christ is caring about the animals, uh, just like he's caring about the people by providing for their needs. And we see this not just in the beginning. Uh, we see this all throughout the Bible when you know where to look for it and how to look for it. But God's constantly not forgetting the animals, just like he's not forgetting us because he loves us and he loves the animals. So now, how would we apply this to our lives? How would we not forget the animals? Well, one way would be to not participate in the buying and selling of them and their products. So you'd want to live a, a vegan lifestyle, as they call it today. And so we want to remember God as well. So God remembers the animals, and we want to remember God uh, and how he treats the animals and how he loves and remembers the animals. So let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35. So Acts, chapter 20, verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we're remembering these words of Jesus where he's saying it's more blessed to give than to receive. So when it comes to animals, how are we looking at them? Are we looking at them as what can I receive from them? Well, I want their milk, I want their honey, I want their eggs, I want, I want to eat their body, I want to wear their skin. Or are we saying, how can I give? Is it more blessed to give or to receive. So how can I give to the animals? How can I take care of them? How can I show them mercy? How can I show them kindness? How can I be self-controlled and be more mindful and remember them and not forget the suffering that's caused by, by just taking from them or paying somebody to take from them so I can get what I want from them? So you want to have this attitude and remember these words of Jesus that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Just like Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to serve. So we want to have that same attitude even when it comes to animals. So next let's look at uh, John 14, verse 26. So John chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So when we're baptized into Christ and we receive his Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit is going to, is going to cause us to remember all these things. And so it's about remembering, just like God remembers us and he remembers the animals, he brings to our remembrance to likewise remember each other and remember God and remember the animals. And so we don't want to forget them. We don't want to sit down at our meal. And, you know, we, yes, we do want to pray thanks for our meal, but we don't want to forget the animals. And we don't just want to say, oh, thank you for, you know, being slaughtered or sorry for betraying you. Uh, we want to not do those things at all. We don't want to 
slaughter the animals. We don't want to betray them. We don't want to be violent toward them. Instead, we want to show them that love and that mercy and that compassion that God shows to us. We want to extend that to them. And that's the way that we can really give back, give that thanks to God. Uh, and showing that thanks by following his instructions that he gives us when he says, Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Or Genesis 1, 29, to eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants, or the plants of the ground, they shall be your food. And so we're trusting in God and being thankful to him and showing that by trusting in his instructions and following them. And so let's look at one final verse. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So this is Jesus' attitude, and he's saying, I only do what I see my Father do. And so if this is Jesus speaking, he's doing this to give us an example. And he says, for, for us to likewise walk as he walked. And so we should likewise think, well, what did Jesus do? What is God doing? And emulating that and following it. And so if God is showing mercy, God is showing compassion, God is remembering the animals, then we should do likewise and remember the animals and not be buying and selling them and slaughtering them and uh, embodying covetousness of wanting their bodies, wanting their milk, wanting their eggs, wanting their honey, wanting their skin. We should put those things away. I said that was the last scripture verse, but I actually have one more. So let's look at Colossians 3, verse 5. It really embodies this idea. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So it's saying, put these things away from you uh, and just pray to God saying, uh, take these away from me. I don't want to have this covetousness. I don't want to have this attitude toward animals. I don't want to forget them any longer. I want to live in accordance with your very good will, and I want to show them kindness. I want to remember them just as you do. And so we pray that prayer and God will do those things. And so uh, hopefully this will uh, be a, a, a message to remember any time that you might find yourself forgetting the animals, that God does not forget them. So now if you have any questions, uh, we're about to get to that. Let's see Jessica. Hello from Florida. Hi, Jessica. Good to have you. Tanya, hello from Ohio. Hi, Tanya. Fred, hi from California. Hello, Fred. Uh, Megan, hello from New Brunswick, Canada. Hi, Megan. Good to have you. Kathy, hi from Minnesota. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kathy. And Renee, hi from Villas, New Jersey. Hi, Renee. Good to have you. Ellen, hi from Covington. Hi, Ellen. And Heather, hi everyone from Sask. Hi, Heather. Glad you could join us. Diana, hello from California. Hi, Diana. Sharon, greetings from Massachusetts. Hi, Sharon. Christy, hi from New York. Hi, Christy. Let's see, Tanya, I have a Bible study group on Sunday at my Carnes Church. So I need a great verse that talks about God's compassion towards the animals. Which one do you recommend to read for them? Hmm, that's a good one. Uh, there's, there's quite a few verses, and uh, one that, that I often go to is one that we talked about in the live talk is Proverbs 12.10. It says, the, the righteous care for the needs of the animals, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. I believe that translation is the, the NIV. And I think the, the New King James says it a little bit differently, something like the, uh, I forget, I, I read it earlier, but that, that one's a good one. And I think that there's also the one in the Psalms where you have to look it up. It's not the one that we looked at, which is also fine to use, uh, Psalm 50, but I think it's, uh, we did a live talk on it. Maybe if someone could find it and post it in the chat, it's where he says, uh, his compassion is over all that he has made. And so, 
Uh, that one's a good one because it's not just over the humans, it's over all that he has made. And so that includes the animals. So maybe you could read those two together, Psalm 50 and then that, whatever, uh, whichever Psalm that is, where he says that. So then it's like, uh, so God is, or, or you could even use the, the scripture verse that we use tonight, that no animal is forgotten by God, right? And if he doesn't forget the animals, then we shouldn't either. So good question. Let's see, Daniel, hi Daniel, good verses. Every verse in the Bible is a good verse because only one is good, namely God, and so this is the word of God, and so they're all good. Except the verses where they're quoting Satan, then those aren't good, but they're kind of, they're good because, well, you get the idea. All right, Shirley, hello everyone. Hi, Shirley. Let's see, Jessica, dominion means to care for the animals and the environment. Dominion does not mean devour. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And the, we mentioned this last week during the Q&A, where uh, if dominion meant do whatever you want to the animals, then in the very next verse, Genesis 129, he wouldn't have said, and your diet shall be the fruit of the tree and the plants of the ground. And so clearly dominion doesn't mean kill and eat the animals. That whatever it means and doesn't mean, we could at least be sure of that, because that's the very first thing God says is, by the way, when I say dominion, I definitely don't mean kill and eat the animals because this is your diet, the fruit and plants. So that's the first thing that you could say, and that would, would definitely support that. And there's also a verse where, uh, let me try to find it. Where it says, uh, I believe it's Galatians 5.15. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. Galatians 5 is a good chapter. So 5.15 says, But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. So what are we doing? If, if God's remembering the animals and making covenant promises with the animals, and uh, so they're, they're part of this covenant fellowship that we have and their uh, Revelation 5.13, all the animals are praising God. Uh, the, the final Psalm, Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If these animals are in fellowship with us and covenant with us in God and they're praising our, our God alongside us, then, well, are we biting and devouring one another? Are we biting and devouring these covenant partners, these, these, these creatures that God made to praise him alongside us? Are we biting and devouring them? If so, he says, uh, lest you be consumed by one another. And so we don't want to be shedding this blood, uh, uh, otherwise it, it'll turn back on us and uh, our blood will be shed. So we don't want to have that lack of compassion for our neighbor. We want to show that kindness. And so, yeah, that biting and devouring, we don't want to be doing that to our neighbor, whether it's a human or an animal. Let's see, Fred. I think Proverbs 12.10 shows that well, and Romans 8 shows awareness of creation, suffering, and groaning, and God cares for delivering creation, which involves creatures. Yep, Romans 8, that's another good one. So it says, uh, let's go there, that's Romans chapter 8. There's a, there's a few verses in Romans 8 that are good to use. So starting with verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the children of God, and then 21, because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So, yeah, that's exactly right. The, the animals are, are also awaiting that, uh, that with us. And so if we skip a few chapters ahead... In Romans 14, verse 15, it says, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with food the one for whom Christ died. So, uh, and then in, again in the, the parallel version, he says, uh, I will never again eat meat. And so we want to be forsaking those things. We want to be giving up, being self-controlled when it comes to you know, killing animals, biting and devouring and eating. Uh, and we want to be in that fellowship. 
and not causing anyone to stumble, whether it's someone who has a heart that cares for the suffering of animals, or whether it's the animals themselves who are in this covenant relationship alongside us uh, with God. So there's there's a whole bunch of good verses. In fact, uh, on my website, it's uh, s2p.org, uh, there's this thing called uh, Bible pa- or Vegan Passages in the Bible, where I compiled about 100 different verses that are uh, suggest living a compassionate vegan lifestyle that cares about animals. So if you're ever in need of looking for a list of verses to use, that's a, that's a handy one. It's not exhaustive, there's plenty more, but that'll give you a good uh, starting point. See, Jessica, animals are our neighbors too. Absolutely, I agree. Jesus says, love your neighbor. And when he's questioned, when he's asked, uh, who is my neighbor? He doesn't say, well, I'm just talking about your fellow Israelite, or I'm just talking about a human that lives within a, you know, one square mile of you as your neighbor. Uh, no, he doesn't say that. Instead, he sort of evades the question, and he gives this parable of the Good Samaritan, and where this, uh, the people turn the other way and, and, and don't help the person who's been robbed, uh, which, interestingly, that's that same term of someone's robbed, who's beaten and, and everything taken from them and left in this this need of medical attention, just like he says, this den of robbers is uh, what they made the temple into. And so anyway, then there's this Samaritan who comes along and helps the person and gets them to the, the inn to get this medical attention. And then Jesus says, which of them is the neighbor to the one who is in need? And the, the person says, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, you go and do likewise. So Jesus never answered the question of who is my neighbor and who isn't, but he says what it means to be a neighbor is to help those in need, even those that you don't know and that who can't repay you back. And so I think of when it comes to animals, well, who's the one who's being a neighbor to the animals? Well, it's the one who's standing up for them, who's, who's not robbing them, but instead is coming to their rescue and is helping them and is showing them mercy so Jesus says, you go and do likewise, show mercy. So that's, that's how I would be a neighbor to the animals, is to follow what Jesus describes as being a neighbor toward them. And God created the earth to be inhabited by all of us. So in a quite literal sense, we are neighbors of each other. He didn't create the world and say, oh, this is just for the humans. You know, the animals, you don't belong here. No, he created the animals first, in fact, and blessed them first before he even created and blessed us. So... If anyone has priority, I guess they would have the priority, but I don't think anyone has priority. He, he created it to be shared by all of us as neighbors and brothers and sisters and uh, family members of each other. Let's see, next. Uh, late but glad to be back on Facebook to be here. Hi from Minnesota. Hi, and I'm sorry, I, I, the name is Jewel. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but Glad to have you. Let's see, Heather. Perhaps if meat eaters could remember that they are children of God and animals are children of God, both are precious to him, they seem to think they are not just more intelligent, capable, but also morally superior. I don't think that's true. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting uh, idea. And I also think of animals as children, uh, but even if somebody doesn't want to say, oh, well, animals are children of God, only humans are children of God. Okay, fine. But this idea that we're more intelligent and that somehow matters, well, that's not what matters in God's mind. You know, if somebody is uh, just born not intelligent, not as intelligent as someone else, that doesn't mean that God cares less about them. So why would we use that logic to apply to, to animals? And God doesn't say, uh, my primary characteristic is that I'm intelligent and that uh, be ye intelligent just as I am intelligent. No, he says his primary attribute is love. And so it's about showing love, not about being intelligent. And we did a live talk on this where it shows very clearly that animals are able to show love to each other, show love to humans, show love to God. So in Revelation 5.13, they're praising God, showing love to him. Uh, The animals are showing love to people. We have Balaam's donkey in Numbers 22. And then we have animals showing love to each other. Jesus compares his own love to that of a mother hen for her baby chicks. So clearly 
Jesus is using his, this to illustrate his love because this mother hen loves her baby chicks in a very real way, real love. And so if animals are able to give and receive love in all the same ways that humans are, then clearly they possess that fundamental attribute of God, which is love. And so that's the thing that we should esteem, not think, oh, well, you're not as intelligent as me, so you don't matter to God. You're No, it's about showing love. So we want to show them love. And if we're not showing them love, we're actually doing less than the animals. And so we want to be the ones who are not only showing love, but teaching those around us to do likewise, to show love. We do that through how we live our lives. Let's see, Patricia watching from Alabama. Hi, Patricia, good to have you. Let's see, Daniel, Psalm 145, Jehovah is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Yep, that's the one I was thinking of. So a combination of Psalm 145 and Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 50, verses 10 and 11, those would be a good sort of combination to show that uh, God's, God, every animal belongs to God and his mercy is over all of the animals and over all of the people as well. Let's see, Shirley, Mark 15, 16, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Another good one. Colossians 1, 19 to 23, Jesus came to make peace with all things through his blood on the cross. Yep. And so he's, he comes to reconcile all things to himself. And that idea of reconciling all to himself, well, that's a return, a restoration to the very good world that God designed the world to be before we fell into sin and death, before we started following the adversary and his ways. And so that's what God is, is restoring. He says, I make all things new. I restore everything. And so uh, that reconciling all to himself, where he's willing to forgive us for what we've done and we've strayed away from him. And so that reconciling all to himself would necessarily mean going back to the way things were in the Garden of Eden, where we're taking care of the animals, we're showing that love, we're following God's instructions, we're trusting in him and saying, get behind me, Satan, instead of saying, oh, maybe Satan has a point. Maybe God's withholding something better from us. No, we just tell Satan, get behind me. I trust in the Lord. And so we want to trust in his way of love. That's the royal law. It says, do everything in love. And so that's, that's the hallmark virtue of God's kingdom, is that we're all, we all have knowledge of God as love, and we're giving that to all around us. And so in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9, we see this very clear picture of what that looks like where all the animals are living in peace with each other and the little child is leading them in this way of peace and all have knowledge of God, no one's harming or destroying. And so, yeah, that's the picture. And we don't just want to preach this gospel uh, to the humans, we want to preach it to the animals. And when we preach it to the humans, uh, we don't want to forget the animals. We want to uh, remember them just like God doesn't forget the animals. Let's see, Sharon. The story of God sending Jonah to preach the message of repentance and turning from their wicked ways is a nice illustration of what Creation Care Church, uh, trying to share the message of living a life of compassion to the animals turning away from the sin of killing God's animals. Amen, absolutely. And that's, uh, Creation Care Church is about doing this for all of God's creation, including humans. Uh, but we see in various churches uh, I'd, I'd say most churches, even if maybe they don't practice it uh, to the extent that they should, they at least agree that we're, we are to show love to our human, fellow humans. Uh, but then when it comes to animals, it's like really a struggle just to get them to, uh, to agree that we should show love to animals. And so what Creation Church does is we try to sort of be that light in the world and shine that spotlight in this area that's so forgotten and sort of left in the dark. Uh, and just really shining a spotlight on all of those places in scripture where God cares about the animals. And so, uh, of course, like if everyone in the world cared about animals, we wouldn't be focusing so much of our efforts on pointing these things out because it would just be second nature to everyone. And so we'd be able to, you know, preach all these other messages as well that aren't as focused on animals. But since there's such a need in the world today, uh, for bringing attention to this issue, this very important issue that's so overlooked, uh, we sort of feel that we have to kind of take the lead in this matter and sort of correct this, this long-standing error uh, that the church has committed. So amen, and 
uh, hopefully all of us who are, who are watching can then likewise bring that into our churches as well through discussions and through uh, talking to people and uh, through just whatever means that you have uh, for interacting. Let's see, Heather, I've had signs a few times, I believe, are answers from God, always through animals and birds. Amen. God's able to work through them as well. I think it says in Job, uh, speak to the animals and they will teach you, they will tell you. And so we want to be open to what the animals can, can teach us and show us as well. Because like you said, that's, uh, that can be the way that God is, is communicating to us. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible is where Balaam's donkey opens up her mouth and she says, what have I done to deserve uh, this, this, this way that you're treating me? Uh, because Balaam's beating her these three times. And so I feel like that's, the, that's what all the animals collectively in the world would say. They open up their mouth and they say, what have I done that you treat me this way? And so I think we just really need to listen to them. Uh, they might not open their mouth the way that Balaam's donkey did and start speaking Hebrew, uh, but we can, we can hear if we just listen to them. We, we hear the bellowing cries of the cow, the mother cow, when we take her baby away from her so we can covet her milk, or we, we listen, we, we hear the, or see the tears going down the, the pig's face as, as uh, they're being thrust into the gas chamber. We hear the cries of the animals in the, uh, the fur farms as they're, well, anyway, I don't need to get going to specifics of those things, uh, but listening to the animals, it's, it's very clear what their message is uh, so often. Just as you know, when your, your dog's hungry or wants to go outside or your cat wants to go into the other room and then back into this room and then back into the other room and then back into this room, like you know what your animal wants uh, because you, you can listen, you, can, you know your animal. And so all animals are like that, not just the ones that you cohabitate with. So it's just about listening to the animals. Let's see, Sharon, uh, Jonah, three verse nine or eight but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to god yes let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence uh, that is in his hands yes and this idea of violence being connected with wickedness and sin uh, is all throughout the bible it, it starts very early on even when uh, it's leading up to the flood in genesis chapter six it uses this term quite a bit where he's uh, saying the world is filled with violence. Uh, and so we, we want to not be violent toward the animals. And so this idea of turning from that violence, turning from that evil, and turning to God's way of love and peace and kindness, that's what we should do. And when we, when we turn to Christ, that's what happens, because that's, that's the, the way of Christ, is this way of peace. And so when we put on Christ and he's living through us, well, we're not going to be doing those things as long as we allow him to work through us fully. And so it's just about allowing that, that spirit of God uh, to dwell in us and work through us. See, Kathy posted uh, the, the, the one that I was talking about where we did a live talk on God has compassion over all. It was uh, FNL number 52. Let's see, uh, uh, do we have a, a verse for it? can't see it from the, I think Daniel mentioned it, it was Psalm 145. Just look at that. Psalm 145. Yeah, I think it's verses eight and nine. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Yeah, I love that verse where it just, it really shows the character of God, where uh, he's, he's great in mercy, he's gracious, he's full of compassion, he's good to all, his, his mercy is over all his works, over all his creation. And so if he says, walk just as Jesus walked, uh, be holy just as I am holy, uh, Jesus says, I can do nothing except what I see my father do. We want to be that image of God and walk with God, being his hands and feet in the world. When we do that, we're exhibiting all these qualities. Uh, and when it comes to how we treat animals, 
We want to be gracious toward the animals, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy, uh, good to all the animals, and have our tender mercies over all the animals that God created and breathe the breath of, breath of life into. And so I think it's very important to embody these traits, uh, not just to recognize that God uh, remembers the animals and doesn't forget them, but likewise, uh, we should not forget them. We should also remember them. Let's see, Sonia, amen. Amen, Sonia. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good place to, to end. We can end in prayer. So thank you for everyone for, for joining us. Remember, we have Facebook Fellowship afterwards if you're able to join us. It's in the CCC Fellowship Call Facebook group. So that's if you type in CCC Fellowship Call, it should come up. There's this cute image of, I think it's a chihuahua and a raccoon or something hugging each other. So that's how you know that that's the group. So if you could join us, we're going to start that in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for being with us and for guiding us throughout this important topic. And just thank you for remembering us. Thank you for remembering all of your creatures and just never forgetting them that throughout the Bible from beginning to end, you do remember them, even amidst our wickedness, even amidst our rebellion, even amidst us not caring and having this hardness of heart. Lord, thank you for forgiving us and not, not letting us uh, fall prey to the, the enemy and be utterly destroyed. But thank you for giving us this hope, this hope that uh, your plan will ultimately come to fruition and your very good world will be restored and uh, the whole earth will be filled with uh, knowledge of you and that no one will hurt or destroy anywhere on your holy mountain. So Lord, we just look forward to that day and let us be your hands and feet in this world to bring about that kingdom. Just work through us, Lord. Fill us with that faith to trust in you in all things, uh, including in how to treat animals and that very good diet that you've given us in the beginning. So we pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to having you again next week. God bless.